Thanks for joining the latest sports gambling education webinar. My name is Scott Shelton here at Sina Education Services. Uh, excited for a all-star panel lineup today led by Matt Holt at U.S. Integrity. Um, before we get started and as everyone gets in and, uh, and comfortable, checks their audio, checks their, um, their, their Zoom settings, wanted to just share with you guys a little bit about what we're extremely excited to launch today, which is the first course at sportsgamblingeducation.com that is um, in partnership with the FSGA. So hopefully you guys can see my screen right now. And what we're launching is today's the very first course in a three course series for a master certification in fantasy sports from the Ohio University uh, AECOM Center for Sports Administration. So what I'm looking at here is uh, we have outlined with many of our subject matter experts, a three course master certification. The first one, introduction to the fantasy sports industry. And for that one, we have um, Peter Schenke from Rotowire, Stacy Stern from FanDuel, and uh, Nick Sol uh, Solsky at Monkey Knife Fight. Uh, SGE402 is interpreting fantasy law compliance and regulation. We were able to get um, Glenn Colton, Stacy from um, uh, Aaron Fox, Stacy Brandenburg from uh, Zwilgen, and Sean um, Ostro from uh, Oric Harrington and Sutcliff, and as well Stacy Stern making another cameo appearance there. Um, and then finally, uh, also launching this summer, SGE403, Analyzing Positions of Fantasy Sports Operators. So we've got a three-course certification uh, rolling out this summer. The very first course, of course, though, which you, you will see if you've been to the uh, Sports Gambling Education uh, website be before, we've got a, a new updated navigation. So the, the original three courses for SGE are, are here, but now we have a new dropdown for fantasy courses. And SGE 401, this really talks about what we are launching today at three o'clock, the course is now available. So um, we talk about really, we break it down into six modules, okay? And we look at the history of fantasy sports, the diverse landscape of, of fantasy sports currently, um, the business models and innovations um, available today, the differences between fantasy sports and sports gambling, the regulation of fantasy sports, and um, some of the protections and common um, pitfalls. So really excited about this course, really um, proud of the hard work and the time. I, again, I want to thank Nick and Stacy that are both on this call um, and this uh, webinar today. They gave us some great, great content. So, um, and just to give you a peek behind the the wall into the actual course, you know, these courses have um, have all video lessons that are also available in podcast format as well and are transcribed. And for some of those longer videos, they, they, they actually have uh, chapters. So in this uh, specific uh, video here in module five, um, Peter Schenke at Rotowire talks about who, um, uh, who regulates uh, fantasy sports, uh, state to state uh, variations, and regulatory oversight and the consultancy that is out there. And then again, if you are an audio learner, you can play it, or if you want to read it and the conversation that he had with uh, Matt Casciato, who is the, who is the um, executive uh, director of the AECOM Center for Sports Admin, you can also read it there. There's pre-lesson, there's lesson, and there's post-lesson um, activity. So really excited about the course. Final note, if you use the promo code FSGA, you get 25% off of your course enrollment. So check that out. All right, without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to our panelist today, who was led by um, Matt Holt at um, U.S. Integrity. Uh, Matt, I turn it over to you. Thanks, Scott. And, and we're awful excited about this course. We had a lot of people reach out and request, you know, they had a lot of success with the sports betting course that we did, the certificate program, and just as many people that were interested in learning more about the sports betting industry, the, you know, the regulatory side, the compliance side, the operation side, just as many people are interested in the same things on the fantasy sports side. And thank goodness at the FSGA, we literally had access to so many great experts and Peter and Stacy and Nick and, and Paul and all the folks on this panel today. And, and I think the course really is going to be wonderful. So we're really excited about the launch of this course. 
I just wanted to quickly introduce the panel and then we'll try to get right into it so that for people watching this uh, video after that they can, you know, get the full 40 minutes of sort of value and what type of things we're going to go over in this course, sort of a preview. So on this panel, we have Rob Fithian, founder and CEO of Sharplink. And Rob is one of the original folks back in the FSGA. Stacy Stern, the Director of Government Affairs at FanDuel. Uh, Digger Turnbull, the Director of Business Development at Forecaster Games. Nick Sulsky, formerly of Monkey Knife Fight. And Paul Charchnian, the founder and CEO of Guillotine League. And Paul is actually the former chairman of the FSGA. So we have sort of a celebrity cast here, the current chair and the former chair. Um, great panel. Why don't we start off back, you know, when I was at Canner Gaming back in the day, we did the first sports betting hybrid, walk into a casino and actually make a bet. We put up two fantasy lineups per week. Um, for for NFL and you could bet against the house pick either one that you wanted and lay a point spread against the house in fantasy uh, and man it, it just went crazy at that time we saw the DFS revolution we even got involved in it ourselves at canner at the time and I, I remember at a time there were over 300 operators at one point it was just fantasy was exploding across the country and the biggest sort of problem back then was data how do you get good data? How do you make sure that that data is affordable yet still accurate and fast? Rob, as somebody who actually started sports data, for people who don't know, that's now Sport Radar US. Talk about the data issues in fantasy sports years ago and how they've evolved now. Yeah, so first of all, this is an all-star cast of veterans. I haven't seen Paul, he lives in my city. I haven't seen him in a year. <laughs> uh, but we started the fantasy business in 1993. So we've seen everything come and go. And the whole evolution that we've hit now with sports betting and this crossover between fantasy players and betting players is just uh, 120 miles an hour of learning. Like just everything's colliding now. And, and back when you were at Cantor, you were nibbling at the edges of betting and fantasy because you were in Nevada, in Las Vegas, in a licensed casino that can start dabbling with the crossover that's happening right now at a very early stage. And as far as the data goes, I'll be honest with you, Matt, there's a lot of legislation happening state by state where uh, there's someone's getting their ear bent saying you got to use league official data and you knew this, you scored your fantasy lineups just based on the website at NFL.com at midnight, right? Yeah. There's, there is no need to have an official data requirement in a betting bill because the casinos will go bankrupt if they're scoring their bets wrong. So they're going to take care of that, that data source. And so it, when it comes to fantasy and data, and everyone on this uh, panel would agree with me, there used to be a behemoth in Chicago called Stats, and it was monopolistic behavior, and they were very tough to work with. And Dave Abbott uh, and I got together at a bar one night and said, why don't we take these guys on? So we, we decided to raise some capital, build a brand new data system embedded in the University of St. Thomas and have 120 students gather data for 15,000 sporting events. And there was a competitor that emerged. Now there was other competitors, Mickey Charles and other things along the way. So when it comes to data and fantasy, it isn't a big deal. I mean, we've always had sources and we've always been able to run our fantasy games with data sources. We just had one really good real-time source that behaved badly in the marketplace. And that's what caused me to get a little interested and take them on. Great. Um, you know, why don't we talk about point of entry in the marketplace because you know everyone sees FanDuel and DraftKings as these big bohemoths but you know if we go back in the history of fantasy everything started by hey you could start a company you could literally start a website Nick started his own company Monkey Knife Fight at one point FanDuel as big as they are now 10 years ago FanDuel was just another fantasy operator in a big ocean of operators they may have been doing it really well but they, they were just one of a lot. So I think that there's still an avenue here 
for people to get into this space, for the little guy to be able to engage in regulated sports betting and in regulated fantasy sports, uh, despite the fact that it's mostly the big names on the billboard. And why don't we start with you, Nick, since you know you have uh, founded a company and in, in, as a fantasy operator and sold that company, and now we're are off to you know greener pastures. Greener, greener pastures. Right? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's what's what's interesting about the data story is it all kind of does flow into one another because it's not when you think about data, it's not just about the you know who scores which goals, which Montreal Canadiens players are going to score the goals tonight against Toronto Maple Leafs. It's also right, Digger. I mean, it's also about projections and it's about the different types of data that are available to be able to create contests around. So you know, while FanDuel and DraftKings, I would I would you know, admittedly say, built the daily fantasy sports industry to what it is today, and they are still the leaders in the space. Um, they aren't the, the end-all be-all with the definition of what daily fantasy sports is and can be. What we're seeing now and what we've seen over a number of, you know, three, four, five years is variations of the daily fantasy sports gameplay and model that um, became possible because the data became more robust, became faster, became more unique, right? So if you think down the road, entering the daily fantasy sports industry, it's very, it's not an easy thing to do because there are a lot of things that the course that that Scott and the SGE are putting on are going to kind of describe everything from regulatory issues to payment processing and, you know, dealing with partners and building product. Um, so it's not it's not easy to launch, but ultimately there's opportunity right now because one sports betting is not legal across the U.S. So daily fantasy sports is still the only real money gaming customer acquisition tool in states where there is no sports gambling. Season long fantasy sports, and let's not forget about that, is still the biggest social game that's ever been invented. Sixty million North Americans play season long fantasy sports every year. I mean, it's, it's huge and it's massive. And so these are the, call, call it the low dangling fruit of the sports gaming industry. So if you want to enter the daily fantasy sports space, the good news is there's capital out there. There's people that want to, to invest in this space if you can come to the table with something a little bit more unique. Monkey Knife Fight, luckily, was a little bit more unique and we had a nice result. There are a number of other companies who are who have created s similar products to Monkey Knife Fight. And now there are companies who are creating even more, or I should say more compelling, even more varied types of fantasy, season long fantasy sports and daily fantasy sports. Paul being one of them with guillotine leagues, guillotine fantasy is starting to blow up. Best ball is a style of fantasy that's exploding. Um, you know, Monkey Knife Fight, which is uh, you know, prop style daily fantasy sports also is, has been evolving. And that doesn't, and, and, and who knows what's next? The great thing about the data innovations, now we're getting, you know, stat cast and, you know, about spin rates on baseballs. When, when are we going to start seeing fantasy sports based around some of these cool, unique stats? It's going to come eventually, right? So I think that the, the market entry isn't, the barrier FanDuel and DraftKings has isn't actually a, ma a massive barrier but you need to come with your A game because you have to create not only a compelling kind of product differentiation from them, but an ability to kind of execute and, and bring it to market because there are a lot of people out there that will help you bring it to market. Stacy, and let's, uh, you know, we talked about the fact that, hey, FanDuel was just another operator in a big pool of operators a decade ago. Let's two part here. Number one. Why do you think FanDuel rose as high as they did? Because, I mean, FanDuel is the premier fantasy sports company in the country now. And what would you say to young, innovative, new folks trying to make their entry into the regulated fantasy sports marketplace? I think it's funny when I remember back to 2009 and 2010 um, and, and the founders of FanDuel coming to the FSTA conference back then and talking about, hey, you know, this is our concept. We think that we see an issue with season long fantasy. Uh, people tend to abandon their teams after a few bad weeks. And, and then that frustrates the entire league. Um, so we think there's this, this product that could be a really good idea. And I actually had the nerve to say, 
I don't know if that's going to work. And they were talking about putting a widget on the site that I was running at the time. And I said, I, I don't think this is for us guys, you know, but good luck. Um, so it's funny now that 11 years later, here I am with the company that I, I think part of why they were so successful is they absolutely believed in what they were bringing to the market. And when you believe it to your core, that you know that there are customers who are going to want to set a new lineup every week, right? And they specifically focused in on the NFL season, which made a lot of sense. And, and being able to redraft every week um, made a lot of sense for people. So I think that was part of it. They were tenacious. Uh, you know, they, they knew that they had to get out there and round up money. Um, and, you know, you'll hear stories about Jason Robbins and DraftKings and the same thing where he got desperate and thought, I don't know that this is going to work out. And sure enough, in the nick of time, was able to round up money. So um, being able to believe in your idea, be tenacious and, and go get funding, uh, very important. Um, and then when you look at, at the space and, and for people to come in and innovate, I think Paul is the perfect example of that. You know, it's what, what Nick has done at Monkey Knife Fight, what Jeremy Levine did with Best Ball at Draft and now Underdog, um, Adam uh, Wexler with prize picks, same thing. These guys have really zoned in on this area of giving people an activity over and over again to engage in and engage in with you know other fans and the sports that they love. Paul comes at it from a different angle and says, it's still sort of a season long product, but you are going to have to bring your A game every week and that's it. You're done. You don't get to continue to participate. So I think that that has really um, caught the eye of a lot of people as well in the industry. So, Paul, everyone's propping yeah. you up here. I know. Let's wow. talk about Guillotine League and what you guys are doing now and, and where you think the industry's headed and what you would say to new people looking to make their entryway into the space because Guillotine League's fairly new. It, it is pretty new, uh, just a couple of years old. And and to um, to reflect on what some of what you guys have been talking about, um, and I think it really is relevant to trying to get into the space even now. If we go back to 2014 and 2015 when FanDuel and DraftKings were blowing up and we'd have our, our industry events and the size of the organization expanded wildly. We had hundreds of companies trying to get into the DFS space. And many of them, you guys will remember, they had millions of dollars. Most of them had millions of dollars of investment because FanDuel and DraftKings were, were so big. And people saw that there were only two companies in this space. And there was this rush with hundreds of companies and millions of dollars. And almost all of them had either the exact same model or they were FanDuel with a twist. And basically none of them survived. They all washed out. And the, the, the people that did survive ultimately were not the FanDuel with a twist. It was people that tried something that was genuinely different and discernibly different. And there, if you can't get to market early with a, a really well differentiated product, I, I don't think it's good enough. You have to be, you, your differentiation has to be so unique that people immediately tie it to you. You've got first mover advantage. You get to, in my case, you get to come up with the name of your style of play. And, you know, there's, there, I think you just have to be really try something that's different and unique if you're going to try to, to get ahead from a gameplay standpoint. And I think that's if it's fantasy or if it's, if it's some kind of a hybridized gambling, like monkey knife fight, well, that was in somewhere in between. And man, there's a big appetite for somewhere in between. You know, Nick, I'd be fascinated to hear what you think, but you know, fantasy has been mined a lot and it, it's, it's been now, it's been a, it's a mature audience. Sports betting is just starting now. It just feels like if fantasy is over here and sports betting over here, man, monkey knife fight was operating almost alone in this middle space. And it feels like there's a humongous opportunity for people to get into, get in now that's, that will take the fantasy sports that people already know and love, but apply sports betting sensibilities to it. And put it into that that gray area space that Monkey Knife Fight did such a good job getting. Well, you know, Paul, I mean, you make a really good point, and I think that what we have to think about is how does the modern day sports fan actually engage with sports, and how is that sports fan going to engage with it three years from now? When people think about fantasy sports and they think about gambling, the ideas about gambling have really come from the mature markets overseas, right? And it's old school. It's you know the money lines, it's the minus one ten, it's very, very, and I don't want to say old school, but it's very traditional. Yeah. The fact is fantasy sports changed the way that we all watch sports. Like NFL Sunday ticket exists because fantasy players were obsessed with watching or the red, sorry, the red zone channel was exists because fantasy players were obsessed with watching touchdowns, right? Yeah. 
the North American sports fan experience has been um, has has been structured in a way or has been influenced by fantasy sports because, quite frankly, we as uh, as a North American sports fan, we are more uh, familiar with we root and and follow individual players and specific players more than they do anywhere else in the world. The audience behavior pattern of a North American sports fan will make sports betting in North America different than anywhere else in the world. And until, and and I think it's the companies that are embracing this kind of, like you said, gray area between I, I, it's fantasy sports and sports gambling, but I I would imagine, I would define it as just the the kind of the unknown area of what the North American sports experience is going to be in a regulated market. Fantasy sports is going to exist. Sports gambling is going to exist. Yeah. But what is that cool hybrid mixture of the two? I, I can sit here and I can tell you what I think, but ultimately, I mean, there's lots of that stuff out there, and I'm already talking too much, so I'll I'll be quiet now. No, Bigger, let's let's get on. your thoughts on sort of you know what you would say to the the young entrepreneur or the company looking to make their entry into the fantasy market now, and then we'll start back again with Rob on the intersection of fantasy and sports gaming. You're on mute, Digger. First of all, to be honest, is great. And I, I'd go back to uh, obviously talking to Paul and Rob way back when, but in 1989, when I set up Fantasy Sports Services, it really was a fledgling industry. So at that time, you're looking at something just like people are today and how they can get into a marketplace and grow that marketplace. To what they've already talked about is there's more than one way to get involved in the industry. You've talked about it with a bit with data. There's also content, which is extremely important. And we've seen providers like VEASAN just start up several years ago and all of a sudden sell to DraftKings and make a huge deal there. And there's also other ways to, to produce uh, content and the one other thing that you know we haven't talked about in the next innovation, which is actually happening right now and ready to jump with the, the new technology, uh, both with the uh, 5G and everything else, is in gaming. So coming up with fantasy games for the DFS along those lines, which you know behind the scenes is happening. Uh, Nick would know this. Stacy would know this. Paul would know this. It is absolutely 100% happening on the in-gaming and how you can transform it to making you a shorter window potentially or feeling like you're a part of the PGA golf tournament and you're a player out there, you know, golfing and, and on the leaderboard, moving up and down the leaderboard based upon your next picks. So there is innovation to happen in those areas as well potentially. Will it be as successful as DFS? It's hard to say, but there's the real opportunity to do something with that there. And I think, you know, what we've, as I said, going back to VEASAN, there was even Roto Grinders on the DFS side. When it started, it became directly related to DFS and it concentrated and became the best at uh, giving DSF information at that time and has done extremely well. So there's more than just one ways to get into the marketplace. The companies that were mentioned before, which uh, Stacy mentioned to the fact that there's not just the monkey knife fights out there who came on just three, four years ago, but there's also the prize picks, the thrive, the underdog, all those. And they have unique different things like guillotine does as well, which is now being innovative. So the word that Nick used right off the top was innovative. And that's one of the things that is there, the opportunity to be that and to be best at brand at that. And make it you know, one of the... Yeah, one of the things I think is interesting, and Nick brought up several points that, hey, fantasy is really popular in states that don't have legal sports betting yet, but now 21 states are taking bets. 27 states have passed legislation, and we're well on our way to get through 30 by the end of the year and probably through 35 by the end of 2022. So all of a sudden here, as more and more states have sports betting, and we see this intersection of fantasy uh, fantasy sports and, and you know what Nick kind of described as the gray area and regulated sports gaming as, as these states open up some of these regulators don't know the difference to them it's just people want to bet on sports what do I do how do we build regulations Rob let's start with you what do you think the intersection of fantasy and sports betting because they're coming they're about to intersect now. What do you think that looks like now? And what is it going to look like in three to five years? Do they both still thrive separately or do they end up converging? You're on mute, Rob. And, and uh, Matt, that's a good question. And I think 
The answer in my head is a dinner I had a year ago or so with Jeff Ma, who people might not know. The people on this panel know who Jeff is, but he's he's kind of a person that lives in the sports betting world more than he lived in the fantasy world, just the gambling world. And so I sat down at dinner with him and I said, what do you think you would want to work on as this intersection's hitting and, and fantasy sports and betting is converging? And he said, you know what, Rob? He says, I'm a degenerate gambler and I don't want to deal with those guys. I'd rather cater to what my kid wants. And my kid is looking for high frequency, low dollar entertainment, right? And I said, that's an interesting thought. So in your mind, uh, the real opportunity, either you do go after the whales because they're sitting offshore in Costa Rica, just like Jason Robbins said, uh, getting those guys on shore and they bet a gob of money every night they really are what drives a sports books PL. But if you close your eyes and imagine three to five years and you are successful in crossing over a fantasy casual player into an in game, simple bet, top of funnel, high frequency enjoyment bet, that's the win. And that's the one to, for everyone to think about if they're going to get into this marketplace. If you, can, if you can be a part of that ecosystem, you don't have to take the bet. You can build the software that enables the bet. You can have the video player. You can have the fast video connections. You can, whatever it is, you're in that ecosystem that takes what a fantasy player really has first is some kind of social connection to a group, as Nick brought up. There's 60 million of them, and they've been in their leagues forever, and they're not leaving. But if you could layer in some kind of fun extra play that's high frequency, low dollar, and you can execute that in the next three to five years. That's the real opportunity. And Jeff Ma kind of shook his head and said, that's where I want to play. I'd, li I'd like to play in that space. Yeah, I, and I, like think that. To, I think to Rob's point, Matt, um, you know, one of the challenges that a lot of the casual sports fan had around a, some daily fantasy sports and some fantasy sports games have been the definition of fantasy point. Like, what's a fantasy point, right? I know what a touchdown is. I know what a goal is. I know what a strikeout is. What we've also seen is we've been starting to see innovations around how daily fantasy sports and fantasy sports contests have been utilizing stats where on Monkey Knife Fight or on Prize Picks or on Underdog, uh, and I'm sure there are others that, I, that I'm not thinking of, you can, you can be involved in fantasy sports contests just focused on the amount of you know, the amount of points LeBron James is going to score tonight, right? I think limiting the barriers to entry is not just, you know, it's not just about product. It's also about how you can make fantasy sports and how you can morph it closer to sports betting um, using proper vernacular and things that the casual sports fan just inherently understands, right? You want to make things easy to Rob's point it's much easier to get somebody to do something frequently if they can kind of understand it right away. Stacy, you are in the unique position where FanDuel operates one of the largest fantasy sports companies in the country, also one of the largest regulated sports betting companies mm -hmm. in the country. So you get to see both worlds. What do you think of this convergence of those two worlds? I, I feel like I'm going to be a little bit of a Debbie Downer here, but it's just this voice of reason inside of me from the regulatory perspective that says we need to remind ourselves that fantasy sports is, is in a silo over here. Sports betting is in a silo over here, the way that they are regulated in the states where they have passed legislation. And I think it's really important to continue to draw this distinct lines right now when we're looking at passing legislation and you want to be regulated um, and fantasy sports should be regulated differently than should, you know, sports wagering. Um, so I, I think that that is part of when you're looking at coming into the industry, you know, what do you have the appetite for? And I think sometimes people with, you know, pie in the sky ideas think, well, I've got this product and, you know, it really does look more like a sports betting product, but they want to be regulated like a fantasy sports product. And, um, that, blurs the lines or sometimes muddies the waters for the uh, current operators in the fantasy sports space. Um, you know, so you've got to be realistic. You've got to be able to, you know, talk with the regulators. And I think something that we've seen too across the country is the regulators really leaning into learning what is the difference between a fantasy sports contest and a, you know, sports wagering product when 
a fantasy sports contest, you're, you're playing against peers, you know, you're not playing against the house specifically. And um, what does this mean for uh, when I'm really introducing a sports wagering platform? I think FanDuel has done a really good job in, you know, we've got the two different apps, we've got the, the different products marketed different ways. Um, and then one other thing I'm going to say, because I think this is interesting from what Rob said uh, with his conversation with Jeff Ma is be thinking about that next generation that's coming up. And um, when, when he said that his kid is going to want something that's higher frequency, that's quicker, um, that is, they, they have always engaged using their phones and they have always um, engaged in, you know, activities that are, that are social because, you know, they're young and they're playing fantasy with their dads, with their moms, with their friends. Um, I, I think that's something that is key because the way that they can take in the information is so much faster than, than the old fogies can. <laughs> for sure my kids definitely do things differently than i than i did when i was their age paul why don't you talk about the intersection of uh sports betting and fantasy sports as someone who spent all you know basically their entire career in the fantasy sports side yeah i just i i don't i don't have a lot more to shed than what other people have already said here but um just firmly believe that that nick hit on the right the right the right formula which is in North America, we were raised on fantasy and Europe wasn't. And Europe's come in and, and they've got their way of thinking. Well, and while Chiefs minus nine is always going to have a place here, there really is a broad audience that was raised on fantasy that is that will want to play in ways that are more familiar to them. And um, Chiefs minus nine is great. And there's going to be huge, huge marketplace around that. And there's going to be there's going to be gigantic marketplace opportunities for the people who um, who are raised on fantasy and want unique ways to play. And um, so I, you know, I think what Stacy's saying is, is is absolutely right that there is a separation and a there's skill versus chance and it, it really is it really is a lot of shades of gray in here. But um, I just think that the biggest opportunity for innovation again remains the hybrid between the two and and figuring out where that space is legally um, and and where you set you know where you find figure out your game and where it sits legally. There are lots of very smart uh, attorneys that can help you figure that out and then. You're gonna to have to work state by state in a lot of cases to explain why you're why you're legal in Colorado and why you're legal in Alabama and and you're gonna to have to work with a lot of people to figure that out. But there's so much opportunity there, and um, I think I think Nick's really really got this largely figured out. But to Stacy's point, huh. and young entrepreneurs should be careful here trying to enter the space. Is you know these hybrid games are great, but in a hybrid situation, we're saying they're mm-hmm. a part of each, but they are very much regulated differently. And of course, everyone wants to be regulated like a fantasy company because the taxes are less and the fees are less. Right. But at the end of the day, there is a distinction and you don't just get to say, hey, I'm a hybrid product, but I want to pay less taxes. So stick me over here. Right. You know that you need to be careful. And, 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 you know, there are lines to to, to two different products. You could go to jail if you do it wrong. I mean, you know, it's uh, you know, this is you're right. You're absolutely right. You have you have to be careful if you're going to get if you're going to get into that gray area. You better be buttoned up. That's you know, I'm sure Nick was, and I'm sure he's been. The company got vetted a million different ways, and you know, um, you have to be in a really good legal standing if you're going to get into that gray area. Well, and you have to be prepared uh, to deal with it properly because you. I mean, we're we're dealing with a we're we're dealing with a course based in Ohio. Monkey knife fight is no longer available in Ohio. In Ohio, new gaming regulations came out after we launched, and I believe, and Stacy can probably confirm this. I believe that Ohio is the only state that inserted language specifically in their gaming regulations that prohibited proposition mimicry in how they defined. Daily fantasy sports, fantasy sports, and game of skill, which is what we are. So we, because, I mean, ultimately the most important thing, if you're going to be a real money gaming operator, you need to follow the regulatory wins. You need to be a good actor. You cannot operate in, you don't want to operate in a gray area. You are, you want to be legal, period. So ultimately we made the hard decision to pull out of Ohio. Uh, we had a good relationship with the casino commission in Ohio. We had a lot of very good conversations, but ultimately, as Stacy can attest, changing legislation is not easy. No. So unfortunately, we all have to work together as an industry, which is one of the core reasons why we all work together at the FSGA and the Fantasy Sports Gaming Association, is we want to work together 
to make sure that as our industry continues to evolve and regulate, that we are all treated in a fair manner whereby one state just doesn't surreptitiously include language that unfortunately precludes or prohibits companies like Monkey Knife Fight to operate formally and officially and properly. So, I mean, this is, you know, it, it, to, to Paul's point, like, it's very important that an idea is, I mean, obviously an idea is the most important thing, but ultimately you need to do your homework. You need to speak to all of the right people, not only from a regulatory position, but also from a payment processing position, because ultimately the most important thing is can you get money onto your platform and can you get money off of your platform to users? If you can't do that with regulated proper US or Canadian banks, then you are an illegal sports gaming operator, period. Digger, I want to get your thoughts on the intersection of sports betting and fantasy and then maybe one minute closing thoughts from everybody because we're coming up on that uh, you know 45 minute mark. Well, it goes back, I mean, 20, 30 years ago, Horse racing was the big, you know, had had somewhat and it just kept losing all of its, you know, basically its track and people didn't understand it. You had to understand a racing form and things like that. So it really is the education. And as everybody has mentioned on this going back, it's we grew up in North America beginning to understand 60 million people understand how to play fantasy sports. So they've integrated that into their social atmosphere. They've also integrated it into their lifestyle and they've been able to pass it down to the generation below. So it really is understanding that education. Keep it simple, stupid. Uh, and that's a formula that Monkey Knife Fight used, not in a negative way, but in a very positive way. People could understand when they looked at the app in a simple way, they knew what they could do. I could show my 23 year old daughter it and she would understand how to do it because she understood sports. And when you were in game, we used to do this ourselves. We'd sit beside each other and watch the out of town scoreboard and just say, who's gonna pick the next goal or, or the next run on the scoreboard. And you'd be able to do that with the out of town scoreboard and just place money on it. So it's keep it simple, stupid, come up with prop type things. And there's no doubt about it that, you know, fantasy sports and uh, DFS will stay around while the sports betting comes in and it will start to learn how to educate the sports betting side. It's not the other way around. The uh, DFS side will educate the sports betting side and what they do. And we're going to see unique things that will happen within the sports betting in North America because of that. It'll actually create new prop bets probably along those lines. But to next point also, it's about if you're coming to this place, first of all, understand the differentiation between fantasy sports and betting. Fantasy sports is games of skill, while betting is games of chance. Understand the different jurisdictions you're getting into. Understand the regulations. Talk to a good lawyer who understands each of these laws within all these marketplaces because it's absolutely different within these market in different places. Have a good tax accountant who understands each of the tax laws within each of these different places. And then also geo-tracking and payment processing, which Nick mentioned as well, because when you cross borders, you can no longer use your mobile app to place certain wagers or certain things. In some places, it's brick and mortar. And all the studying will help you because then you can understand where your idea can grow and thrive from. You know, two things you said, I thought we could do a, a separate panel on each of them. One, the social component to fantasy sports and sports betting is so critical to, I think, the future and success of it. That social component and social engagement grows every day. We could do a panel just on that. And then payment processing. We all know payment processing could certainly be its own panel and all the challenges with it. I, well, I want to thank it will everyone. Be. It will be its own panel at yeah. the FS, <laughs> FSGA conference in uh, Dallas, Frisco. We encourage you to attend. Uh, you can come to Dallas and learn more at thefsga.org. All right. All right. Good job, Paul. All right. Let's, um, uh, we only have a few minutes, so I'm just going to go around the horn. I just want to thank you all so much. I think this has been great. We're so excited for the launch of this course and the future courses to come for the FSGA and SGE and uh, the Ohio University program. So why don't we start with Rob, go around the horn. One minute, anything you want, fantasy sports and sports betting. Yeah, I'll just close by saying that in this uh, market of convergence, we're in very early days. And I think a lot of people are trying to think about how to marry the two. Uh, I am beating the drum that there's 60 million people that play in communities with their friends and you should integrate sports betting period and not do hybrid. So I'm, I'm more of a 
extra bet inside of fantasy guy. So, and that, that is where I think the big market is. And there's communities there already that exist and there's going to be technologies and infrastructure that's going to be built specifically to integrate contextual offers inside of these 60 million sticky players. Huge, huge market. I think that's where I would focus. Thanks, Rob. Appreciate it. Uh, why don't we just go in the order you guys appear on my screen, uh, Stacy Stern. I actually agree with Rob there. I think that the the sports wagering side is still in in its infancy. I think we've got the 60 million uh, Americans or North Americans who play fantasy sports. I think we have just hit the tip of the iceberg on getting people away from the offshore market and into the legalized uh, regulated betting within their states um, that have it. We still have states that don't have mobile sports betting people. I and mean, we have still have states that have a monopoly running sports betting or it's brick and mortar only. So there's a long way to go with the regulatory framework for sports wagering across the United States. Um, and then I think that the, the micro bets, the in-game bets, the simple bets of the world uh, with 5G and with the technology that's out there. And again, these, these, the fast paced world of sports entertainment, I think those in-game bets are going to be enormous. Great. Thank you, Nick. Yeah, I agree with everything Rob and Stacey said, and I, I typically do. And that's kind of the point that, I, I, that, that I'll leave everybody <laughs> with. Um, the thing is, I've been in this industry for a long time, as of, uh, as of all of my friends, literally my friends who are on this panel. It's a very small industry, right? You think sports gaming is massive. It's actually really small. And the coolest thing is most, I'd say like most people, with the exception of Paul, are really great folks. I'm just kidding, Paul. <laughs> we are like, we're the really nice people and more, more than anything else, and, I, and I'll speak to this directly because I've got, I've been bugging everyone, you know, everyone on this panel. I've bugged from one time to another to pick their brains. We all like to talk to people, right? Reach out. Don't be shy. LinkedIn, Twitter, whatever, right? Like, if you have an idea, if you want to get in the industry, just reach out to someone. And that's like, that is how our industry has grown. It's grown very granularly like that, like friends, meeting people. So don't be shy, right? If you want to get in the space, come in the space and go for it. Love that. Thanks, Nick. Uh, Paul? People have hit on so many things. I'll just go back to payment processing. If you are looking for payment processing, it's a huge hurdle and you're going to have to get really smart on it more than you think you would and be sure to work with a payment processing company that really knows uh, fantasy sports and sports betting. And if they don't, they can torpedo your whole company and they can really damage your company. And if you already have payment processing, don't assume you're going to be able to keep it because um, we are viewed as high risk industries and one day, um, some bureaucrat at some company just decides, you know what, we don't need we don't need fantasy sports or we don't need sports betting. It's you know it's too dangerous, it's too risky, and the next thing you know, you don't have payment processing. So, um, I just encourage people to give a lot of thought to that. Whether you're a startup, or you're you're in it uh, already. Um, it's a real area of of risk for any any company. Well, Nick, I think Nick touched on it earlier, and that's a great point, Paul. That. Basically, you have to be able to do two things, fantasy or sports betting. Get money on your platform and get money off your platform yep. in a regulated and legal way. And if you can't do that, you can't run a business. And nobody thinks about it ahead of time. They're like, oh, I got this great idea. And they just kind of assume that it's good. It's going to come along and it, it doesn't always work that way. That's a really good point. Thank you. Digger, close the show for us, my friend. Oh, first of all, thanks, Matt, for having us on here today. A great panel to be involved with with these seller people. Uh, I will say for this, you know, and all of us agree, you know, so excited about the opportunities that this time presents. And we thought we were potentially in a mature market 10 years ago. Then we thought we were in a mature market five years ago. But we see with people like Monkey Knife Fight and those who've come along in that, you know, prize picks, others out there as well, is that innovation, as we let off the show, we'll probably end it with here, and ideas are absolutely always being created. And with the new technology that, as uh, Rob was saying, the games, the apps, the content, the data, all have an opportunity to grow in different ways and add back into this because we're not just the game itself. There's also, even you know, from integrity side of things, there's so much more that happens behind the scenes. And then one thing that I will expand upon that all of us will agree with is networking. Nick hit it right on, is to talk about your idea and make sure you get the right 
uh, information back to people so that you can grow your idea and make it happen. So it's an exciting opportunity. And I think everybody's right. We're certainly at the tip of the iceberg. Everybody talks about in-play betting, but we still haven't even got to the point yet where the technology and the odds sync up with the viewer experience that the viewer is watching. So, I mean, we're still such in the infancy of all of these things. This industry is going to iterate and innovate and iterate and innovate time and time again over the next five years. And the technology is going to catch up with the desire and the demand of the users. And I, it's really exciting to be a part of it all. Thank you all so much. Thank you. And, you know, thanks everybody. And we'll turn it back over to Scott and the folks from sports betting education. Thank you all. Great job, everybody. And uh, on behalf of everyone here uh, at Sina education, at Sina education services and Ohio university, we're extremely proud to partner with the FSGA and be a part of education and awareness for your industry. So one last time, I just want to share my screen and um, remind everyone that today the brand new course between Ohio University Sports Gambling Education Program and the FSGA. Uh, this course is now live and available at sportsgamblingeducation.com. It is SGE 401, Introduction to the Fantasy Sports Industry, featuring Peter Shanky, uh, Stacey Stern, and Nick Solsky from um, Rotowire, FanDuel, and Monkey Knife Fight, respectively. Thanks, everyone on this panel. We're extremely grateful for your time and expertise. And um, the next webinar coming up is um, on June 10th with uh, Sports ETA, uh, the Sports Event and Tourism Association. So we will look forward to uh, seeing you all there. Thanks, guys, again for your time and expertise.